Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and, and welcome everybody. Um, <laughs> I've never been, well, I, I moved to Singapore in September of last year. I've never been to this venue before. I feel like I should be debating Brexit at this point rather than talking about APIs. But, um, and it's the clicker moving all around. Is it, is it possible to fix that, the clicker moving? Sorry, it was uh, quite bothering me when it was moving all around, so try and fix that. Uh, so thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, as, as John mentioned before, I think tomorrow is going to be heavily on financial services, and there are a lot of people that understand the APIs uh, much better than I do in, in that context, and, and they'll be providing a lot around that. What really I want to do today is set the stage and give you a little bit more of a holistic view and how APIs are changing things in financial services. I think when you look at financial services in general and, and kind of this fintech revolution that we've had, the nature of fintech in Asia is, is really unique uh, and quite a bit different than we're seeing in other parts of the world. So today, what I want to go through a bit is, is tell you a little bit about um, the, the digital transformation, what's happening in digital, how things are moving away from payments, and what that means for APIs. To start off, CB Insights did this slide in 2015. And so if you're not familiar with CB Insights, they are a data provider predominantly to um, VCs and private equity providing information about startups and valuations. They took the Wells Fargo website and showed all of the different ways that fintechs were going to disintermediate Wells Fargo. So the idea here being that uh, if you look at savings, if you look at asset management, if you look at financial products, in many different ways, the traditional banking system would be disintermediated and replaced by all of these fintech startups, as has happened in other industries, as we're seeing in ride hailing with, with taxis, et cetera. The reality is somewhat different. Uh, if you live in the U.S. or if you live in Europe, there have been slight, subtle changes to the nature of financial services. There are certain areas like in international payments, you have companies like TransferWise or Venmo in the U.S. that handles domestic payments that are changing individual niches within the market. But this wholesale change of fintech disintermediating the traditional financial industry really hasn't happened. But it has happened here in Asia. This is a slide just comparing mobile payments in China and uh, the US. And for those of you in the back, this is not a mistake. There actually is a small line there on the right that does represent China. Now, I was based in China until September of last year. Um, and clearly, you know, across many different segments of Asia, uh, mobile payments and digital payments are really changing the nature of financial services in the way that uh, 3 billion people bank and handle their financial services. And a key part of that is APIs, as we'll walk through. Even for myself, uh, living in China, I spent a tremendous amount of money on these platforms. Um, I, <clears throat> in, at the end of every year, Alipay does a summary of your financial spend. And so at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, I had spent $65,000 on Alipay, which is a tremendous amount of money. And, and as you can tell, I'm not a local Chinese. So for the locals, it really is a tool for how they handle their finances and how they handle their business on an everyday basis. Across Asia, this change is happening very rapidly, especially when you look at emerging areas, emerging areas of the economy, emerging areas of Asia. The growth in digital payments is very quick in fact, quicker than it is in mature Asia. Now, why is that? In many of the places, not necessarily here in Singapore, but in places like Indonesia and Malaysia, the unbanked population, and indeed the underbanked population, is tremendously high. Uh, the infrastructure is not there in terms of uh, technology or, or, or actually banking branch infrastructure. Obviously, uh, in, in many cases, uh, individuals are very thin file insofar that they don't have a lot of credit ratings. And so, these payment platforms are providing the outreach to a lot of those people because using your phone to be your bank is much easier than actually going out and finding a bank in many of these jurisdictions. And this is being enabled by a tremendous shift towards smartphones. 
Uh, in China itself, the smartphone penetration, we're hitting about peak smartphone in China right now, but by 2020, it should be about 75% of all the phones that are sold in China are smartphones. And, you know, that penetration rate across Asia, when you look at the, the number of smartphone users and the penetration rate, still has a ways to go in many other jurisdictions. Now, in places like the U.S., <laughs> the U.S. PC ownership rates in the U.S. are about 80%, meaning that 80% of households in the U.S. have access to a computer. Uh, in China, that number is about 50%, meaning about 50% of the households have access. Smartphones, for many people, are the device of choice, just because PCs aren't as prevalent. If you think about the historical context of the one-child policy as well, for many of the youth and the millennials, they've grown up at home. And your choice when you're home is uh, either talking to your parents or being by yourself because you don't have any siblings. Um, now, in my case, I'm also an only child, so in many cases I was off on my own as well because getting, talking to your parents gets a bit boring as well. So even from a young age, many of these people were growing up with the smartphone being the device of choice and their primary form of communications and, and engaging with other people. A key element of this transition has been QR codes as well. If you think about mobile payments in general, uh, here in Singapore, contactless is very popular. Uh, you also have Apple Pay uh, coming into sp the space as well. But in many jurisdictions, QR codes are a very elegant example and an elegant choice. Uh, you have kind of two ways that QR codes can be used in places like China. One is a static QR code and one is a um, dynamic QR code. One is the first being the merchant presented QR code and the second being a dynamic one that you would present on your phone. Now if you think about the traditional process for a merchant to get a credit card, to be able to accept credit cards in a place like Singapore or any developed market, it's quite intense. Uh, so you have to find a bank or find a merchant acquirer you have to sign up, there's a lot of paperwork, there's potentially a lot of cost involved in getting that point of sale device to be able to accept credit cards. And then there's the cost. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm American and it's very common that credit cards in the US have a 1% foreign transaction fee. And the merchants will pay anywhere between two to 3% uh, discount rate on any transactions. Here in Asia, <laughs> as I've just found out from my trip to Thailand last week was that the foreign transaction fees are at 3% on many of the cards here. So you add up the 3% that the consumer is paying and the 3% that the merchant is paying, and that's 6% of cost that is in a typical credit card transaction. When Alipay first launched QR codes in China, uh, often you would see a phone next to the cash register. So you would go into the restaurant, and instead of using a card, you would see the phone on the table, and that phone would be the point of sale device. To sign up for the account, all you needed to do was to go onto the Alipay platform, fill in a form, and you were up and running. There's no visiting the bank, there's no expensive fees, there's nothing uh, on top of that. And then, in addition, the uh, transaction fees, the merchant discount rate for that was 60 basis points. So about a third of the transaction fee for other um, forms of payment, including credit card. QR codes are a very unique solution uh, in Asia. Uh, they're very low cost, they're very easy to implement. Uh, when Alipay first started looking at mobile payments, if you're familiar with the concept of NFC or near-field near communications, many of the phones today, at least the upper-end phones, will have a NFC antenna in them. Now, while the NFC antenna is very standard for many people in this room who have an iPhone or you know, a high-end Samsung, they do add cost. And when you think about some of the emerging markets in Asia, if it costs 2 to $3 for the manufacturer to include an NFC antenna, that passing on to the customer could be 10 or $15 in added cost. Whereas QR codes work on pretty much any smartphone. Any smartphone that you can run a, a third-party app, uh, you can typically have the processing power to present a QR code. So why does this matter? This matters because platforms are the future and payments are the basis of platforms. So we've talked about how in Asia, payments have, digital payments in particular, have grown very rapidly. 
When we look at what's happened in China and increasingly what's happened here in Southeast Asia, we're seeing the rise of the platforms and the idea of super apps. Uh, what we've done on the screen is we've taken the WeChat wallet and we've disintermediated that. So we've basically looked at all of the functionality that would be on a WeChat wallet. If, you have a, if you're on WeChat and you have a Chinese ID and you're using the Chinese version of the app, this is what you would see, obviously in Chinese, but this is, this is mine, which was um, using the English functionality. So whatever you want to do, you can do on this app. If you want to chat with friends, you can chat with friends. If you want to order a car, if you want to book flight tickets, if you want to invest in wealth management products, you can do it all in one app, one super app. Why is that important? Well, it's important because payments were the backbone of that uh, interface. And this is really where APIs start to come in as well, because the apps that you're seeing on this screen, uh, most of the apps that would be on the home screen of WeChat would be uh, apps that Tencent has an invested relationship with, meaning that they've bought equity or they've actually bought out the company and, and set it up themselves. But on top of that, there are a number of uh, mini apps that individual developers develop and connect into the WeChat ecosystem. Now, the mini apps, they don't get shown on the front screen here because there's limited real estate, much like a supermarket shelf, but there are thousands of these mini apps that do everything from uh, you know, arranging travel to helping you pick out the latest fashion to any number of functionalities that use APIs to connect into this. And that's becoming increasingly important as platforms take over. Uh, China really is the leader in the idea of these super apps when you look at Alipay or WeChat Pay. But on, according to last stats, uh, you know, 800 million people, almost a billion people in China use these apps every day. And they truly are super apps. Now this is happening in Asia as well, uh, when you look at Grab as an example. The interesting difference between the two is when you think about a super app in China, it's really a super app for the consumer and the merchant. So the merchants that are on these apps are using these apps every day, as are the consumers who are using this every day. Grab, you may only use a couple times per day when you're ordering food or when you're taking a, a, a grab share. Um, it, it's not as much for the consumer a super app. But for the merchant, in certain areas in Southeast Asia, this is the super app for them because they have this open every day. And what you're seeing on a lot of these apps is the financial services being layered on top of that. A couple weeks ago, Zhongan, uh, the large digital insurance giant from China, announced a partnership with Grab that they're providing a technology to enable insurance for drivers. Uh, Grab is most definitely looking at digital banking services, lending services for the drivers, essentially for the merchants. So although these aren't a super app in terms of the kind of app that you would be opening every day, they are very important to the people that are using them. Now, on top of payments on the back end, we're seeing in China the layering of additional financial products and services. Now, on many of these platforms, you can invest your money, you can borrow money, you can get a credit rating. Increasingly, people's financial lives are being driven on these super apps, using that, that layer of payments functionality as the basis and then moving up on top of this. Um, just a quick side note, a few people are taking pictures. Uh, there's going to be a link to download the slides at the end, so you're more than welcome to download those. But of course, if you want pictures of me, take them now, because I, I won't be available for download later on. Um, so there's a couple of different implications for this. Uh, the first is that the relationship with the financial services providers are, is changing. Uh, so if you think about a couple of years ago, if you were investing, you'd think about you'd be investing with a, Charles Schwab or an E-Trade or Janus or one of the asset managers or DBS. Increasingly, if you ask a Chinese consumer who they invest with, they're going to say WeBank or WeChat or Alipay. The relationship is moving away, and it's a bit fuzzy on the screen. I like to consider myself a sophisticated investor, but to be honest, when this platform first launched, it was open up to foreigners. I didn't care who was providing the product. I just cared about the return and I cared about the duration. So it's one month and it pays 4%, or it's one week and it pays 2%, whatever that is, I don't care. But that relationship is moving away from the providers to these third-party platforms that are these super apps. In addition to that, one of the other implications is the financial impact. 
So we looked in China and we said, uh, you know, what, what is the financial impact to the traditional service providers? So if you think about QR codes, that is typically card revenue. So that would be revenue that would go across a credit card or a debit card. In 2018, nearly 47 billion US dollars was lost to the digital payment providers. So that's basically saying that all of the transactions that could have gone across a credit card or a debit card that went across a mobile phone um, amounted to about 50 billion US dollars, which is a tremendous amount of money. Certainly for myself, uh, maybe for some of you in the room, it's pocket change. But um, for the banks in China, it's also pocket change. If you think about an ICBC, the largest bank in the world, has tens of trillions of dollars in assets under management. So the idea of losing uh, you know, a fraction of this, say $5 billion, is a large amount of money, but it is not overly significant to some of these larger organizations. What is more significant is the data. So think about that super app. Think about payments as the basis, and then think about all of the other things that you're doing on this app. I would be just as guilty of giving up all of this data as our uh, theoretical user here that we're explaining on the screen. I've used these platforms when I was living in China to book travel, to book taxis, to book uh, shared bicycles. If you think about the transaction information just from the shared bicycles, just think about that for a second. They know the time, they know the location, they know where you're going, they know how fast you're going. You can make all kinds of implications about the person based on that. Um, specifically for credit scoring, which is what we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, just thinking about biking as, a, as an example, I was just thinking about that myself. Something that came to mind is how fast you're biking. You know, that might be an indication of your health or your recklessness. Uh, if you're taking a car home at 3 a.m. in the morning from a bar street, and you're only getting to work at 10.30 in the morning, it might be an indication of, you know, are you a credit-worthy consumer? That information is becoming increasingly important, especially in places where we're seeing alternative financing. In China, the banks don't focus on the consumers and the SMEs. They focus on the large corporates. They focus on the state-owned enterprises. Why would you lend to Zenin at 7% when you can lend to PetroChina at 6.5%? You're almost guaranteed to get your money back. The cost is very little. And so a lot of this lending has gone to other um, individuals. And so what this is leading to is the idea of situational finance. And that's really being able to provide the right product to the right time to the right person. Using all of this data to provide a service to an individual. And that's arguably something that a bank is not able to do. Um, and, and this is something that a lot of the third parties, either directly through these third party platforms and these super apps, or through APIs that connect into these apps, are able to do. Is by accessing all of this data to create a profile of the individual. And when you're sitting here in Singapore, it's often easy to forget uh, you know, the implications in other markets. I would, I would venture a guess you know, that most of you come from a large financial center, if not here, then a you know, nearby country. Um, but in the third and fourth tier cities around Asia, this is really where it's making an impact. Digital payments and this, this super app ecosystem. Um, the woman on the screen, her name is Kaiyu Ma. She lives in the city of Ordos in China. And Ordos, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the ghost cities in China. And ghost cities was one of these cities that the Chinese government built and said, if we build it, they will come. Well, they built it, nobody came. Ordos, in particular, was heavily hit by the coal uh, decline in coal demand over the past couple of years. Uh, the area around there, there's a lot of coal uh, mining and burning, and so the, um, the area was hard hit especially after the, the financial crisis, and it's never really recovered. Kaiyu Ma has a small child, married and with a small child, and her husband worked in the coal industry but lost his job. In order to make ends meet, she launched a store of her own on Taobao, which is one of the large uh, C2C e-commerce platforms in China. Today, along with a number of other uh, female entrepreneurs in Ordos, there's a coterie of small shops that are selling baby clothing online in Ordos. She hasn't needed to go to a bank who wouldn't have lent to her. She hasn't needed to set up a storefront, which would have been expensive. She hasn't needed to set up the relationship to accept credit cards. She's able to do that strictly on her phone right away and get started. Digital payments and the ecosystem that they are creating is enabling economic empowerment. 
This gentleman's name is Joe Wei. Uh, we have uh, often go down to Hangzhou to meet with Ann Financial on a fairly regular basis. And one of the last trips that we took down there, they, they brought us to meet Joe Wei. Joe Wei runs a scooter shop. Uh, so the shop is not much bigger than the corner of the room here. And at any point, he has kind of eight to 10 scooters that he's selling, as well as four to five scooters that he's um, repairing. He's been in business for about eight years now. Uh, he accepted Alipay and WeChat Pay for the past couple of years. Uh, but often when he needed to expand or he had a lot of capital uh, that it was required, he needed to borrow money from friends and family. Obviously, if you're buying, if you're selling eight to 10 scooters, you have to buy those scooters and then you have to sell them. So you have some capital invested in the inventory. What Ann Financial noticed over time is that his relationship uh, with his consumers was a little bit different than the relationships that you or I might have with our friends and family. If you think about your use of digital payments, it's like a mesh. You might be sending money to your wife or husband, to your child, to your child's school, to your friends, to your family. You might split the bill, it's a mesh. There's money going around, but there's kind of a limited subset with the occasional payment going off to a merchant otherwise. If you think about the case of Joe Wei, it's more of a hub and spoke. So he would be sitting in the middle and he would have individual relationships with all of his consumers and all of the people that came to his shop. Certainly some of those consumers would know each other. But using the information that was provided by just his daily transaction volume and financial was able to make the conclusion, okay, this person is a merchant. And in that context, they, provided, they started to provide him financial services offerings. So uh, over the course of the next three months after he got uh, initially contacted by my bank, which is part of and financial, now he has a $15,000 credit line on my bank that he can use. This credit line has enabled Joe Wei to expand his business. He no longer has to borrow from friends and family. And it's created a new economic lifeline for him and his his, his growing scooter sales and repair business. Another individual that is impacted by the digital financial ecosystem. So what does this mean for APIs? Well, basically we have a number of different things that are coming together within the financial industry that are changing the nature of the, um, the ecosystem fundamentally. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, I started off my career in Citibank uh, in 1998. And when I was at Citigroup in Portugal, I was the head of technology for Citigroup in Portugal. And basically anything that plugged into a wall was considered technology, even the copy machines in 2004. And you know, if you had seen some of the banking systems that were in place in 2004 and probably still are in place today, you'd be horrified that your money is sitting on some of these arcane systems. But that's the way the financial industry is. Finance, finance and technology have had a long pedigree. But it's really only in the past couple of years that this idea of fintech has really taken off. And we define fintech as bringing together finance and technology in a way that creates a new business model that was impossible to um, produce before. So you have this interesting uh, number of factors that are coming together. Uh, first of all, the rise of fintech in general. Secondly, the idea of virtual banks. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, the first licenses in Hong Kong for virtual banks were given out. In Australia, there are a number of challenger banks. Malaysia just made some announcements that by 2020, they'll be licensing virtual banks as well. So new, often digital only, virtual banks that are coming to market are changing the nature of the game and, and also impacting APIs. Data, as we talked about before, there's a tremendous amount of data sources. One of the few things that Ant Financial actually goes out to get is data around uh, transactions. So they engage with a company called Threat Metrics to get information and data on fraud so that they're able to incorporate that into their own systems. Across the industry, people are using APIs to pull data into their systems to make better decisions around financial services and products. And finally, the new customers. The new customers that are increasingly demanding a different kind of experience. They want a digital experience. They want a mobile experience. They want it integrated in their lives. Payments. Financial services are increasingly becoming the backbone that we no longer pay about, care about. Rather, When I came here in a grab this morning, the payment happened on the back end. I didn't even pay attention to it. Sure, I got the note, but to me, the, the, the payment was just, it, it just happened. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to put in my payment details. And increasingly, that's the way that financial services is going, and APIs are a critical part of that. So uh, conclusions. Um, 
just to wrap up kind of this brief introduction that I've given you, uh, although FinTech is a global discussion, it's an Asian reality. As I talked about at the very beginning, the impact of, financial, of, of FinTech here in Asia far outpaces anything else, uh, anywhere else around the world. We looked at transactional information. If you look at assets under management or valuations or footprint, uh, the companies that are engaged in this ecosystem in Asia, the N Financials, the Lufaxes, the Tencents, and increasingly the Grabs and the Gojeks dwarf anything that's happening anywhere else in the world. Uh, largely due to the population, to the factors we talked about before, they were really changing the nature of financial services. Digital payments are changing the way that Asia banks. Uh, payments provide that basic level of infrastructure, and then on top of that, we're able to label it, uh, layer additional financial products and services. Uh, you may not understand Snap, uh, Instagram, but you better understand Instagram. Um, this used to say Snapchat, but then I had a millennial friend who said Zen and Snapchat is old, uh, like you. Uh, it's Instagram now. Um, one of my friends is, is literally a German rocket scientist. He's a PhD in rocket propulsion. And he, he used to be the head of data for Snapchat. And so I had been regretting this conversation for many, many months, but we ended up in New York at the same time, and he sat me down, and he's like, Zenon, let me explain Snapchat to you. And we sat down for about 45 minutes, and after watching his kids wearing googly eyes, watching pigs jump around in the background, I still didn't understand Snapchat. I don't understand why we need to have disappearing messages. I guess maybe I can understand, especially with Trump in office and things like this, why <laughs> disappearing messages can be important for your political future. But otherwise, for me as a person, I, I don't really care. I don't, I don't need that functionality. It's similar, like Venmo is a good example. Venmo is a payments platform in the US that started off being social payments. Why you would want to socialize payments is beyond me. But for the millennials, the millennials who are using platforms like Venmo, who used to be using platforms like Snapchat and are now using platforms like Insta, which is a term that I <laughs> learned, hit me up on Insta, I learned last week. You may not understand why people are using these platforms, but you need to understand why people are using these platforms. And what I mean is that as practitioners in the industry, some of these trends may not make sense to us. But we need to understand that because the customers that are using our platforms are the ones that are using these. And that's why we need to understand who they are. Customer experience is critical, and customer understanding is even more so. And so being able to bring those together and understanding what they're doing to offer them the right product or services is critical. The payment model, or the model, revenue model in financial services is changing as well. Uh, when you look at how these companies made money, often it was by the payment fees. Increasingly, this is changing to the products and services you can layer on top of that. So it's not just about the 60 basis points that you would get for making a merchant transaction, it's all of the other products and services that you can sell on top of that. And that's changing the, the way that a lot of these companies are, are positioning their products and services. Again, leveraging that data. Technology is important, but not as much as a strong business model. Um, if you've looked at the technology behind Alipay or WeChat Pay, there's nothing that's unique there. God forbid there's no blockchain that's involved in Alipay or WeChat Pay. There is a bit of AI, but the technology is nothing new. That technology that those platforms are using has been in existence for at least a decade, if not more. The critical thing that they did was they understand what the friction points are in China, and they address them. Alipay was initially set up to solve the issue of trust in e-commerce. Then it expanded to use QR codes. If you do a card transaction in China, it is a painful experience. All of the cards in China are chip cards. So to do a transaction, it's often chip, pin, signature. The idea of contactless doesn't really fly in China. When you think about that as compared to a QR code, it's, it's a question of friction. Japan invented QR codes a couple of decades ago. There's nothing new about these technologies. So don't get blinded by the technology. Uh, understand that the business model is a critical aspect. APIs are a critical part of the future of banking in Asia. For the reasons that we mentioned before with virtual banks, with fintechs, with these third-party players that are coming to market and increasingly demanding customers uh, truly what you'll hear over the next two days, and especially tomorrow, will be about the implications of APIs within the financial industry. Whether you're a bank, a service provider, or another third party that's interested in the space, 
strongly encourage you to pay attention to everything that you hear, because the experts that uh, John and the team have lined up are really incredible over the next couple of days. But it will really dramatically impact, uh, I'm sure, all of the industries that you, you folks are involved with, uh, for those of you who aren't in the financial industry, but certainly from looking at it from my perspective, within the financial industry, this is one of the largest changes that we will see uh, in the next couple of years. So um, as promised, there's a link to the uh, slides there. If you want, uh, you can also sign up to our newsletter if you'd like to see. And do we have time for questions? Or OK. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Zenon. Um, can we have a quick round of applause, please? So I did have a snarky question for you, but before I do my snarky question, maybe I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I think, John, there are some mics floating around. Um, yeah, we've got one question here. So this question comes from a non-millennial side. Um, people that refuse or don't like to be on the social grid, be it uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever, I still don't know what Instagram is either. I'm actually attending on Friday a, a, a pitch on it to understand it more. The point is situational finance. So, you know, we're talking about the millennials, we're talking about countries where it's evolving. Surely there's a market there, but there are certain aspects of people that are not playing in that space. Um, what are your thoughts around, are those people just gonna be excluded because there's enough mass market to where people that don't wanna be so much on the grid can still participate, or what, what's your view on, on sort of the anti-social outlook of people that don't want to be so connected? Yeah, we have a special room for people like you on the uh, <laughs> backside. No, it's a good point. And I, I think it, it's worthwhile separating that into kind of the financially excluded versus the financially excluded, so, or included, rather. So if you're financially excluded, uh, you know, oftentimes, it, Africa is a great example with M-Pesa, right? I mean, M-Pesa, is using simple feature phones, so just text-based phones to enable payments. Um, and that digital platform has, has enabled uh, farmers and, and people to become economically empowered and access financial services that they wouldn't be able to access before. And I think certainly in, in Asia, when we look at those financially excluded, you know, the, the, there are companies in China that are focused on migrant workers and providing them financing to get a smartphone. Um, so I think for many people, the smartphone is the channel of choice, especially those that are, you know, working outside of their home country. It's a way to, you know, many of the foreign domestic workers here in China, it's a way for them to, um, sorry, here in Singapore, the, it's a way for them to keep in touch. So I think increasingly, we're seeing just in general the adoption of, of technology to support lifestyle and then financial services on the back end of that. I think, you know, as the millennials grow up, the next generation, I don't know what the next generation after millennials is called, but they will grow up, at, you know, technology, digital native. In other words, their phone is, uh, our son who's seven months old is already fascinated by the smartphones. And so I think that generation will just become, it will just be part of their lives. Now, that does come back to your point about there is this segment of the market that still needs to be serviced, and they will. I mean, the traditional financial industry is uh, used to serv servicing people in an offline environment. But you know, in many cases, the access to the newer products and services or the better value products and services won't be as great. You know, if you look at some of the digital offerings for Joe Way there, if he borrowed from the bank, he'd be paying eight or nine percent. If he's paying, if he's borrowing from um, uh, one of the digital platforms, it may be five or six percent. So, you know, the, the, the cost of services or the benefits of these services, I think, will, will drive people towards the digital platforms regardless. Um, but, but still, you know, point taken, there's, there's still going to be a segment of the market that will be offline. So we've got time for one more question. Um, for WeChat Super App, today is still pretty limited to only China. Um, you know, their availability for foreigners are controlled, actually. So. Do you see anything else outside WeChat for the non-Chinese world? Yeah, so one of the things that we've struggled with over time is why the large American tech companies have been unable to or unwilling to replicate what WeChat, Alipay, um, and indeed Baidu have created. Baidu, uh, if you're not familiar, Baidu is the largest search engine in China, the, essentially the Google of China, but with 
without all of the results on, on particular topics that you may find on a Google. Uh, but Baidu has actually launched a financial services product. Uh, so they have taken anonymized and aggregated search information and they combined it with the CSI 100 uh, stock index to create a financial product that they took to market. Now, that's something that is well within the purview of Google. Uh, why they've chosen to avoid financial services kind of up until the previous year is a bit uh, unclear to me. But I think, you know, I refer to WeChat and Alipay, first of all, because it's, you know, it's, it affects 1.3 billion people, uh, plus the few people outside of China that do use these platforms, and it's a great case study. Uh, you know, I think the next nearest thing that we have is here in Southeast Asia with Grab and Gojek, and potentially what we're starting to see with uh, WhatsApp and using payments on WhatsApp or on Facebook, we're starting to see a little bit more engagement around that. But I think the, it is still very limited. I think in certain markets, like in the US, it, my friends in the US are very used to using 10 different apps to do the same thing that I do on one app. And any of the friends that I have in the US that use WeChat are people that have lived in China or have some kind of business relationship with China that makes it necessary. So by no means are these players going to be the dominant players globally. Uh, they could be, they may not be. Um, in many cases, we're seeing their international expansion be much more strategic as well. So as an example, Ant Financial and Alibaba's foray into India, rather than setting up Alipay in India, they invested in Paytm in India. And so they've incorporated a lot of their technology and their know-how into that platform while still leveraging the customer understanding and the footprint and the brand that Paytm has in the market. So we may see different approaches by the Chinese tech players as they come abroad. And they're definitely, Southeast Asia is a big focus for them. But um, you know, the ubiquity of some of these apps, it may be a while before we see some of the Western apps have that same footprint. Thanks, Zenon. Great. Can we have a quick round of applause, please? Thank you.